On this week's newest, latest, best, we've got Beyond Two Souls, Don John, and Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. All that and more coming up on this NLB. Welcome to Newest, Latest, Best. I'm your host, Jeff Kanata, and I wanted to start right here at the top by thanking everybody who watched the last episode and gave such great comments. Remember, you can also send emails to nlbfeedback at gmail.com. All right, let's get right to the newest. Newest. This week's newest video game is Beyond Two Souls for the PlayStation 3. It's David Cage's heartwarming tale of a girl and her entity. This one made a lot of hay because it actually is starring real actors, Willem Dafoe and uh, what's her name? Ellen Page. Ellen Page, thank you. Ellen Page, how could I forget? Uh, this is a Quantic Dream game. Those of you that know me remember that I happen to love Heavy Rain. Back in the Totally Rad Show days, Heavy Rain was the Totally Rad Show game of the year. But these games are not for everyone. This is a, uh, some people call it an interactive movie or a choose your own adventure. The idea here is that you're watching a story unfold and through controller movements and quick time events, that have to do with what the character is doing on screen, you're influencing the movements and selecting, almost unbeknownst to you, a whole variety of outcomes as they happen. So there's never a game over screen in this game. There's never a, a way to lose or fail. You're only ever just branching down all kinds of different pathways. I happen to really like that. I'm a big fan of games that eschew uh, fail states and let you go forward just with differing outcomes. Others might criticize the game as playing itself. I think that misses the point. What you're supposed to be doing here is investing in the character and role-playing all of these events. It's not about whether you win or lose the game, it's constructing a series of really interesting moments. It's making these small decisions that all add up to a tapestry of this life. The other interesting thing, and, and a big difference between Heavy Rain and Beyond Two Souls, is that this is non-linear storytelling. This is seeing very disjoint, disjointed moments of this character Jody's life. Some, one moment you are a teenager uh, at a party, the next moment you're a five-year-old girl in your house, the next moment you're in the CIA as a 20-something. You're jumping all over the place, and Oftentimes, I think that can be jarring for people, and I certainly would understand if people, if someone felt like this game didn't really make any sense as you're going through it. I, however, happen to really like that. I enjoyed thinking about these as little fractured moments of a, of a larger life, and almost vignettes in and of themselves. It was like watching a series of short stories about this girl and her supernatural friend. Some of the short stories were horrific, some of them were action adventure, some of them were mysteries, and some of them were just little slices of life. I've never played a game before where I've had a little tea party with my dollies as a five-year-old girl. And while some people might consider that to be boring or not exciting as a video game, I was so invested in making all those little decisions and all those little choices and really experiencing what it was like role-playing this person whom I will never be and never have been, that I found it to be a fascinating, interesting, fulfilling experience. This game isn't for everyone. For me, I loved it. I found so many moments of excitement and pulse pounding. I mean, the action moments are wild and over the top and crazy and as good as a, a, a lot of action films. And they really figured out a wonderful way to do quick time events. Rather than having button prompts pop up on the screen and pull me out of the experience, now, Jody will initiate an action and I'll continue her action with the right thumbstick. It's more intuitive and yet still challenging. I thought that was a really great innovation to the genre. I like it. I'd recommend it. It's a really fascinating experience and unlike any other video game, uh, Quantic Dream is just doing something all their own and really pushing the limits of what video games can be. For that, I applaud them and recommend this game if you have an open mind. Next up in the latest, Christian Spicer is back to talk Don John at the movies 
and Marvel Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. on TV. I'm very excited to welcome back Christian, who has agreed now to be the semi-regular go-to <laughs> review guy. <laughs> on occasion in which time Most of the it happens time to here. work. And then I'm happy to be here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you're back. Uh, Christian, of course, you can see on his show what's new. What? You're going to be semi-regular now, so I'm not going to say that stuff anymore. It's whatever. You can see me right now. You can see him right now <laughs> on this show. You're watching it. Uh, we're talking about Don John. Yeah. The, uh, I think, writing and directorial debut yes. of, of uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt. I'm a big fan of his. But uh, he's written a script, a very unusual script, about a... Is it politically correct to say Guido? I'm Italian-American. I guess I can say that. <laughs> Uh, it's the uh, New Jersey Shore type that we're all familiar with. It's who's... Garden State for real. <laughs> <laughs> right. This is a guy who's used to going to clubs and picking up girls and uh, then going home and masturbating to internet porn. And he's addicted, in fact, to internet porn and then meets Scarlett Johansson, who is the 10 that he's always wanted. And she changes his life in a whole bunch of weird ways. What did you think of Don John? I really liked it stylistically. I think for Joseph Gordon-Levitt's directorial debut, it did a lot right. He didn't try to do something crazy. He didn't try to do The Dark Knight. He didn't it's try to crazy. do... And, well, I mean, in terms of as a director. Okay. He had maybe, what, four set pieces that right. he used, similar car shots, but it was punchy. I mean, the cuts were great. Music was great. Um, accenting those shots at the beginning of the you just movie. Just like Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch. I, I'm a fan, <laughs> but it got me going. Like I wanted to go work out. I wanted to go. I was like, I was feeling that adrenaline of like a dude bro. Right. Like, it He's conveyed a that. Dude bro. In terms of the picture itself, I wanted to like it more than I did. Okay. Um, it left me at the end feeling as if his character, he comes to a resolution, but I didn't feel it was earned. Okay. I feel like they ran out of time and he was shooting a 90 minute movie and he was like, and then I learned something. Credits. <laughs> is how. When, did it make you think? I felt like it was, uh, I felt like the movie was marketed really wrongly because I felt yes. like it was marketed as a comedy, <laughs> rip roaring comedy, and it's not a comedy. This is, this is more like Silver Linings Playbook than anything else. I felt like it was, it was really about something that's... Uh, I mean, it, I think it's a post postmodern movie. This <laughs> yeah. is this is the internet generation. This is pornography is readily accessible to everybody, and it kind of f's up your life in a, potentially, or this at least this guy's. I made me think. Did it not make you think? It had a message. I mean, it definitely had a the message. M. Yes, of you know, this is a, a, a serious thing. But I feel like he didn't take enough of a stance as as to whether is, is internet porn really that bad. For the character, I right. feel like he didn't. It didn't earn his justification at the end. Where now I've connected. I've connected. Well, I think it was a metaphor for for fantasy versus reality. I think there's a whole bunch of different ways in which the false version of something, the the fakeness of life. I mean, even his hairdo it goes through this transformation. Right. Uh, and it's all about having a real live face to face interaction with someone versus internet kind of inter interaction with somebody. And I think in that way, it's very much of a 21st century movie. It's very much, I don't know another movie that really tackles the subject of, hey, we don't relate to people anymore. This is about sex, but it's also sort of about just relating to people. Well, that's where I feel like it fell short because I feel like he was trying to make that larger point that you just said, because he refers, Joseph Gordon-Levitt's character talks to Scarlett Johansson and tries to make the analogy that her watching romantic comedies is the same as him watching porn. And I wanted to see more of that. I, I wanted him that. to make that bigger picture that we are not connected. I agree with that. And, and then make it a, a strong character piece. And we see Joseph Gordon-Levitt's character grow as he learns to connect and trust with more than just Julianne Moore. Right. More with his family, maybe with his sister. And, he, and he, I just feel like he sprinkles on that stuff and spent too much time, I enjoyed watching it, but at the cool club scenes and with his bros, mm. and then when his good friend comes in to connect with him, his one friend comes to check in on him, I feel like that was out of the blue and yeah, not earned like either. Yeah, those guys didn't really behave that way in any other point. Exactly. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with you where it felt like he was trying to create a parallel kind of situation with Scarlett Johansson and her 
her investment in a fantasy and her yeah. trying to create him in the image of this <laughs> false ideal that she has sure. in the same way that he was trying to create women in the false ideal of, of a porn star. Uh, but I agree with you that that w never really developed and it never really turned into anything. But I really liked the movie. I, I, I thought it was really interesting. It made me think. It, it I thought it was pretty ballsy that he was dealing with those kinds of issues in his first, first film because it's like... It's kind of in your face about all that. I mean, <laughs> in, a, in a very real sense, it's in your face, in your facial, really. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Tony Danza is also in the movie. And jacked. I know! Holy. What's Tony Danza been doing? Who's the boss, indeed? <laughs> he is so... He's in a wife beater the whole time. I know, and just, his shoulders are, like, it's, yoked. It's incredible. It's incredible. <laughs> but yeah. it's super fun to watch. I think, his, I think the editing's on point, the music's great. Uh, the cuts of like him watching the porn or finding his center is like really interesting. And yeah. It shows him zoning out with like these flashing images. It very much felt like it was kind of uh, had elements of Spring Breakers. Yeah. Where I think, but if, it's not. It's not like a laugh riot. No, 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 a, no, no. This is not. If you're looking to go to the movies to to laugh, this isn't going to happen. And if you're, it, it'll probably make you uncomfortable watching it with whomever you're there with. Especially if it's one other guy in a theater and you're both alone. <laughs> or your girlfriend. I mean, that's an, it's an awkward conversation on the way home, potentially. Yeah. Uh, about, you know. He says a lot of things about what all guys do, honey. <laughs> you're like, Aah! Anyway, we'll, uh, we'll pull off as well and uh, hit our next topic. <laughs> if you're geeks like us, chances are the most anticipated TV show of the new fall season was Marvel Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., which I always dislike judging a show from one episode. That's why we have waited until four <laughs> episodes are now out to, to discuss this big, big show. I don't know of any other time in the history of television where you've had a television show crossing over from films, having characters that are the same. It's the same universe from a movie that there's going to be more movies coming out. There's this is unprecedented and super exciting, especially if you're a Marvel fanatic like I am. Uh, Agent Coulson is the center of the team that he's built a brand new team in the in this first episode, uh, and uh, they are out and about solving crimes like Shield or not solving mysteries like Shield does that have sometimes to do with superheroes, sometimes not. We get a lot of talk about the battle for New York from the <laughs> Avengers movie. Christian. Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., are you uh, assembling to watch it? I'm a huge Joss fan. So yes. that needs to be out there in the open. Buffy, Firefly, all these are your jams. Dollhouse, when it wasn't. Dollhouse even. When Dollhouse got canceled and he was able to just go, I'm done trying to satisfy the network with Monster of the Week and I'm just going to do the big story arc, uh -huh. was some of, I think, the finest I never stay Joss television. Yeah, I never it's, stay it's that like long. four episodes at the end and it's really good. This show feels very Joss to me. Dialogue, certainly. And at young, sexy characters mm -hmm. is very much, and people that aren't quite believable. So the, the hacker, right? and she gets, I feel like, the most flack if you hear people talking about the show. She seems very much how Buffy started, or how a lot mm -hmm. of characters in his world start, where you're just like, oh my gosh, I don't like this person at all. But then you end up loving them? And she disarms you, and then yeah. all of a sudden, like he, season two. he somehow sees something in the casting process that is like, there's something d deep down in there. It's going to take five, six, seven episodes to get you to love that person, but you will. I th that's how I feel about a lot of Joss shows. And I don't know if you're the same way. Looking back at them, I love them all. But I need to remember the first four episodes of Buffy, I was like, I'm done with this show. I'll yeah. give it one well, more everyone week. Says the, I, I have to come out and say I... I'm not a buff. I didn't watch Buffy. Okay. But I watched the first season of Buffy, and everybody's like, "Oh, the first season! You, can't, you gotta get past the first season." I'm like, halfway through watched, season that's two. That's a lot of hours of my life that but, I invested but, in that to just not see, just get past it. Yeah. Well, it's true. Halfway through season two, it goes to eleven. Yeah. And see, I feel I like I feel like Shield is getting there. The pilot, I, I didn't enjoy very much. I don't know about you, but I liked elements of it. Sure. It's very Monster of the Week. Yes. Still. Yes. Uh, which I've never enjoyed. I'm not that guy. But one of the things that's really interesting is I feel like there, when I was growing up, when I was a kid, the airwaves were chock full of action adventure shows. That's like what what I want. A Team and Dukes of Hazard and, <laughs> and Miami Vice and I mean it was all about like little action scene punching fisticuffs. 
you don't see that on TV anymore. I couldn't think of it. I mean, other than Buffy, you know, which is however many years old too. Well, it's become grittier. It's, it's Hawaii Five O again, but Hawaii Five O today is isn't what it isn't as fun loving as those shows used yeah. to be. They were cheesy and a little winky. Yeah, but and that's fun. what this is. Yes. This is a throwback to that, and I, you kind of see why those things kind of got phased out because movies were doing it at such a grander <laughs> scale yeah. that it does feel this feels very TV. It feels it, not not in a good way. Yes, you know, and that's unfortunate. I happen I love all the Marvel crossover y stuff, but I feel like the show is going to be less and less and less about that just by by necessity because they you know, they have to do have their own agenda and come up with their own situations and over these four episodes, most of them are just sort of like it, it doesn't have to be a Marvel show most of the time. It most of the time it could just be this Mission Impossible type show. Right, where I feel like it makes it a Marvel show, though, and you're saying there's ever been a show like this. I feel like it's a live-action version of the Ewok Star Wars show when we were little. Where it, it's, it's That's a, not a good thing. <laughs> well, aside from the negative connotation of that show, but it's an hour-long commercial for this movie universe, That's and it's enough to get younger us's interested. I mean, it's, uh, I wish I could. I wish I could be a younger us. I know we would have so much fun stuff to watch. <laughs> Do you think that when Thor come, Thor two comes out? We'll there'll be something imme- like immediately in the in the series. It's gonna be so weird that a movie will hit, and then will there be some ripple in the television show that's concurrent? Uh, I mean, that's so strange. Yes, sweeps. sweeps? They line up. Yeah. Thor two comes out right around when sweeps is starting. My mm. prediction is you'll see Thor from the back, so it won't <laughs> be it won't be Hemsworth. Wig. It's a wig, and they'll be like. <laughs> All right, or something. He just, he just backs into the shot every time. <laughs> something. Either that or it's just B-roll from Thor that they, that's not in the movie that they just cut to and you're like, that looks it's way... Like, it's like when I was a kid and, and we wanted to find Santa Claus and he was always just leaving. <laughs> yeah. That's how it would be. You see a like, cape. Oh, Tony Stark was just <laughs> here. Ooh, yeah. you, oh, you just missed him. But you know, he left this armor. <laughs> Unwrap it. Yeah. We got this email. Let's decode it. <laughs> So are you, the, the, the thing that is most tragic to me about this show is that it stays on my TiVo. I, I want it to be the show where, oh my God, there's a new episode and I run to my TiVo and I watch it. And it's not that yet. It, it really isn't. It, it's, it's a show where I'm like, oh, I got two of those. I should probably watch them. And I enjoy watching them mostly, but I'm not, oh, it's, I gotta. I don't know if it ever will be. And I don't think it's meant to be that mm-hmm. show to you. One of your favorite shows of all time is The Shield. You really One of? Enjoy- your favorite the, show is Shield. Shows like Breaking Bad. Yeah. Shows like Mad Men. I don't know if it's you know we've aged up or if there's this TV that's different. And, and Shield isn't meant to be like the movies. The, the TV show to me isn't like it can't be right. Yeah. And they're going for a different market, and it's fun, and it feels like um, a serial adventure hour. And you're just like, with bang I wish bones. it was more serial. I wish I want more serialized. I want it. I want. To be continued. So there, I want, well, I mean, they are. Is Coulson Coulson? Yeah, is the true. hacker going to betray him? Is yeah. Who's the cavalry? Right. Uh, is Graviton or whatever his name? I, B Marvel. I, I can know B Marvel characters, C Marvel characters, like whatever Graviton's real name is. I don't know it. Um, <laughs> yeah. Lose me. Well, yeah, are you gonna, you're going to keep watching? I bought an iTunes season pass. So oh, I'm committed. So I'm, committed at yeah, this I'm point. committed for the first season. All right, well, that's what we think of Marvel Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. My best bet this week is a great best bet because it's free. It's a free-to-play browser-based game. You can play it in any browser, and it's called Card Hunter. This is a game that I have been completely addicted to. It's got a really charming old school D&D vibe theme kind of thing. It's as if you're sitting down at a table playing Dungeons and Dragons with cardboard standees and obnoxious dungeon masters. So it's got that kind of comedic fun vibe. But the gameplay is pure hardcore strategy. You're fighting these scenarios, attacking monsters by collecting cards. It's a card-based combat game, kind of like Memoir 44 on the tabletop. But this is a digital game and it takes advantage of that by using something that would be impossible on, the, uh, on an actual tabletop. And that is, every single weapon that you loot in the game, and you will loot a lot, 
is based in cards. So you'll get a variety of cards when you get a new weapon or item of any kind, and you compose your deck of all these cards from all these different kinds of weapons. It allows for awesome different strategies. There's a wide variety of things to do. Some of the free-to-play hooks are a little annoying in that it's constantly asking you for money or dangling things in front of you. If you just paid a little extra, you could have this. But man, there's a ton of fun here to be had for free, and I found myself wanting to pay for it. That's cardhunter.com. Check it out. I bet you'll dig it as much as I did. All right, that's it for this episode of Newest, Latest, Best. But as always, I'm going to send you out with some best bets from my friends. This week, I have a couple of great guys. Scott Johnson, cartoonist from Extra Life and uh, the guy who does the Instance podcast, the World of Warcraft podcast, and Justin McElroy from Polygon.com and the hilarious, awesome comedy show, My Brother, My Brother and Me. If you're not listening to that podcast, download it immediately. I guarantee laughs. All right, thanks for watching. I really appreciate it. And until next week, do your best. Hi friends, your old buddy Justin McElroy here, managing editor of Polygon.com and co-brother of My Brother, My Brother, Me and Advice Show for the Modern Era. Listen, I got two books to recommend for you today. Books. When you're ready to go to sleep. It's my tagline for books. Uh, first up is You Don't Know Me But You Don't Like Me. It's by Nathan Rabin, who's a longtime contributor to the Onion AV Club. Uh, this is a book that parallels Fish and Insane Clown Posse fans, follows them around on tour, uh, two of music's most maligned tribes, as it says right there on the dust jacket. It's uh, fascinating, it's really, really funny, and it has allowed me to inject more juggalo references into my everyday life whoop whoop so it's worth the price of admission alone secondly a book of poems oh i know what you're thinking poems gross but these are about video games okay that doesn't sound better but uh but our princess is in another castle by bj best is actually quite good it sort of compares real life to the experience of playing some games so for instance uh getting a cancer diagnosis is seen through the lens of playing marble madness super weird super interesting super cool read it in fact, read them both. Books. Check them out. Hey, Jeff. Scott Johnson here. Thanks for having me on the show. I really want to talk to you guys about Planetoid. Planetoid is a comic first released in 2012, June, I believe, uh, by Image Comics and was written and drawn by Ken Gehring. The main character's name is Silas, a deserter turned space pirate who ends up as the sole survivor of his crew. They crash on a planetoid in alien territory where we must fight off these huge mechanical creatures, cyborg militias, and the alien military, which has a bounty out on him. That's the short of it, but I cannot tell you how much I love this hidden gem. It's a very small, very short independent comic that uh, was shopped around, and Image ended up taking it on, and it ended up just awesome. I absolutely love Ken's artwork. It's uh, sparse, and it's what I love about science fiction. Big, open, horrible places where it's dry and there's no vegetation. It's the Tatooine lover in me that loves what this book does. And everything is so burnt out and destroyed and rusted and void of any kind of beauty. To me, that is the beauty of the comic. It is the beauty of the visuals of the comic. And he creates a lot of really interesting, expansive space that really showcases uh, kind of the, the dread of the place that Silas finds himself in. The writing is really sharp. Anybody who knows me knows I love post-apocalyptic tales. And it doesn't really matter where you put it, but I, am, I have a preference for the desert the Southwest, um, where it's just crusty and dirty and terrible, and you have to take shelter in caves and dark rocks and terrible old shacks that somebody has left, uh, you know, from years and sometimes centuries before. And this comic just exudes that kind of place. And whenever he's in, an, when Silas finds himself in a small, cramped space of some sort on a ship or in a hallway, I'm like, dude, you got this entire desert to yourself. Go outside. And, uh, and let's explore some of that more. I absolutely love that. That's why I love games like Fallout. This uh, really scratches the Fallout itch if you're interested in that kind of world. If I only had one complaint about Planetoid, it would be this. It's far too short. It ends way too early. And I hope that we end up with more of it one day. It's really fantastic. Again, that's Planetoid. It's available on Comixology, all kinds of other digital downloadable comic services. And you can get the back issues as well. Uh, via Amazon and other places. I love it. I know you'll like it as well. And it just scratches all my science fiction itches all at once. Uh, check it out now. That's Planetoid. And thanks for having me on.